Okay, you guys can see that okay? Yes. Okay, excellent. Hold on one second. Hey, hey Gabriel. You guys have a little more quiet? All right. Um, Okay, folks, so uh, hope you had a good weekend. Um, today we'll be talking about, we'll continue our discussion of scattering. Um, and um, that's the deal, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna approach scattering from the Green's function perspective. Um, and uh, I tried to introduce that last time, so I'm not gonna just everything we did last time, but, but I, I do want to sort of introduce a little bit of the topic and just sort of remind you what we're doing. I mean, the idea is that we have some potential and we're shooting a wave at it and then it's scattering into some direction and we're basically trying to find out how much uh, gets scattered in that direction, how much stuff goes off into that final direction starting with the initial direction. And we were thinking about it, you know, classically. Classically, we, we think of this luminosity equals number of particles per time per area. And uh, quantum mechanically, we think in terms of J is equal to probability per time per area. And so we just convert between these two these two things. Uh, and so using this very simple reasoning, we know that if the luminosity is hitting some little bit of area, then that, that tells me how many particles will scatter per time, dn. If I divide both sides by omega, this is how I like to remember it, because then you can very quickly see that d sigma d omega is equal to one over luminosity times dn d omega. And then to get quantum mechanics, you just replace the n with r and the l with j. And you see that the cross section is one over j, the probability flux times dr dt, I'm sorry, dr d omega. And that's the probability per time that flows into the detector. Instead of particles per time, it's probability that's flowing. Okay, so that's a, that's that's the main that's the main thing that basically tells us that's the differential cross section that tells us the probability to scatter into a certain into a certain direction. So that's like the most physical quantity, even though it's like a weird kind of way of thinking about it. Uh, and so we um, we calculated this, you know, using the Born approximation using um, Fermi's Golden Rule. We did that, but but we realized that that wasn't good enough. And so we have to, for many situations, the Born approximation is not good enough. So we have to go a little further. And, and the new way of thinking about it is, is that the, uh, we, have, we need a more general approach. And the more general approach is to really start with the Schrodinger equation, H psi equals E psi. Uh, where H is going to be kinetic energy, that, you know, the usual thing, kinetic energy plus the potential. Um, and if we have some potential, then we really want to solve the Schrodinger equation and, and get the full wave function. So I'm drawing the wave function with these, like a contour map, because it sort of is like a contour map, you know, and you go further away, looks like that, and then you go here, and it's kind of looks like that Professor, and so it, yeah um when born approximation fails like i think last in the last lecture we were saying that that's the case when we can't approximate the wave function to be a good plane the incident wave to be plane plane wave function 
Now the incident wave really is always a plane wave, but it's the total wave function, the scattered wave, the scattered wave. So the when, idea, yeah. It, yeah, it's when that, it's when that, it's when uh, basically for the Born approximation, we're approximation, approximating the wave function to be a plane wave. The wave function to be a plane wave. Is that, what would be the case when the wave function not to be a plane wave? Well, that was the example that I gave last time, which was- like the hard scattering, right? A hard ball, yeah. Exactly, because if I have a hard ball, then you know that the most important thing is that the wave function has to go to zero. You know, I, I can't really draw, but the wave function has to go to zero at the ball. Because the a hard ball, the most defining characteristic of a hard ball is that the wave function goes to zero at the ball. And a plane wave doesn't totally doesn't have that property because a plane wave just, just flies along and the wave function is not zero inside of a plane wave. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, one more quick question. So for like a like a real life example, like um, like an example of proton proton collision at LHC. Would that be the case for, like, there's like a hard scattering and then not? Um, I don't know anything proton about collision. Proton. I don't know anything about proton proton collisions. I'm not a high energy guy, so I know like zero about that. I mean, you know, a proton is a core, a bag of quarks. You know, like, I mean, I so it's complicated. Like, so I have no idea what happens in the large and the LHC because that's like out of my specialty. But I do know some condensed matter analogs. And I will show an example of that when I'm sort of done with all this, not this lecture. I think it was gonna happen like maybe two lectures in the future, I was gonna like work out an actual example. And, and you have examples in your homework, you know, uh, but we gotta start with like simple stuff, you know? So I don't, I don't know enough to tell you like to what degree I can approximate proton-proton collisions in these various approximations because I, I just don't know proton-proton collisions. But I do know that these these uh, approximations work very well. For example, if I have uh, an impurity atom in a in a copper crystal, then the impurity atom behaves like a hard ball, and the waves, the electron waves that travel through the metallic crystal, follow uh, this Green's function approach perfectly, and it describes it beautifully. So you know, think of it like that, <laughs> but you might be, a, you know, a high energy person. So I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> so, um, uh, okay. So, so now we, um, have this idea of this wave function where this, what I've drawn is the wave function. It's the solution at some energy because the energy is well-defined in the scattering. That's sort of an assumption that we're making. The energy is well-defined. Uh, and so here I can define the, here I can define the, uh, I can cut. So once I have the wave function, I can calculate J because I know that the probability flux is H bar over two MI times psi star del psi minus uh, psi del psi star. So you can calculate the probability flux, the incident probability flux once you have that. And you can also calculate the scattered probability flux because you just calculate J. It's that same formula. And if I have a detector here and the detector has some area, DS, um, then um, we can, and, and, and you remember, you know, DS is going to be equal to R squared D omega um, R hat, right? That's the little area vector, right? That little DS. Um, and so then you can see very easily that um, that this dr that you want here is equal now to j dot ds. And so now we can see that using this approach, we have a new way of thinking about the differential cross section. It's equal to going to be still one over j, the incident probability flux, times uh, j, the probability flux dot ds divided by d omega. And so where this is the, uh, this is the solid angle of the detector and that's the, that's the area of the detector. So you can think of these as being properties of the detector. 
So then you can see then that this is really the best way to think of the differential cross section. <clears throat> but then we are stuck with this problem that we have to find J. But to find J, we have to find the wave function because J is just that psi star del psi minus psi del psi star. You know, we've got to do that. And so we've got to find that. Um, but to do that, we have to solve H psi equals E psi. So we're kind of back to where we started from. All roads lead to the Schrodinger equation. So that's what we got to do. And so let's solve that. That's what we're going to do. But what we're going to do now is we're going to, we have um, positive energy. And so this is kind of a regime where you're not so familiar. You're more familiar with solving the Schrodinger equation when E is negative. So when you have discrete bound states, but now we have a continuum. So that's why there's sort of some different math involved. And so we're gonna use the Green's function approach to solve it. All right. And so now what we're gonna do then is let's, so now let's dive into the Green's function approach. <clears throat> and I realize that this is math. So we're just gonna do some pure math right now. Uh, hopefully you've seen it before, uh, but I'm gonna sort of give a lightning quick review. Um, I'm assuming that most of you have seen this in some mathematical methods course, but you know how it is with math. Sometimes it falls through the cracks and you don't know it. So I think that it's not important in this class for you to be an expert at Green's functions. I, I wanna kind of go through it because I we're gonna drive some very important results. And so the, more, the most important thing is for you to understand the final results that we get. So I, I do not expect you guys to be experts at the Green's function, but I, but I will just show some of it because I think it's important to see, sort of see where everything comes from. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so how do we do Green's functions? I mean, there's many different ways to do Green's functions depending on how sophisticated you are. There's like, you know, it's one of those gigantic topics that can just swallow you up. So let's not get swallowed up. Let's just do the simplest thing. <clears throat> so let's consider a differential equation. A differential equation, just a generic one. And here's a generic differential equation. Um, some constant A times D squared, DX squared. Um, let's see, uh, what am I gonna use? I'll call it Psi of X plus B. Uh, so this is meant to be just some random differential equation, d dx of psi of x uh, plus c of psi of x is equal to f of x. Okay, um, and so, well, actually, let me, uh, and so then uh, what we can do is we can, um, um, then what I can do is I can just write this as some operator times psi of x is equal to f of x, where that operator d is equal to um, a d squared dx squared plus b dx plus c. Okay, so I can always write it in this form. You can always come up with some, you can always write it in, in, in this type of form. Um, and so then, um, what we do is, is we think of uh, this as the source term, and we think of this as the solution. That's the thing we're looking for. And, and, and so there's, what makes the differential equation complicated is that there's two functions. You're taking all these derivatives of your solution, the thing you want, but then you have this other random function thrown in <laughs> that f of x here. And that's what makes it so hard. Um, and that's why differential equations are hard to solve. Um, but th the way of looking at them is, but this is a nice way of looking at them is that you have a source term and a solution. And this differential operator is, is hitting your solution. But <clears throat> the way to think about it is that this, a nice way to think about it is that the source is sort of causing something to happen to your solution. And, and here's a nice example for this language. Let's consider sort of, I think the most important differential equation is Poisson's equation, because this is how we solve uh, electricity and magnetism and also elasticity and all this sorts of stuff. But from, in my world, Poisson's equation is probably the 
after the Schrodinger equation, Poisson's equation is the most important one. Del squared phi uh, of R, and you've all seen it, or, or I think you've seen it. This is uh, the basis of electricity and magnetism. I have um, charge density, charge density, and then this is electric potential. And maybe some of you have not seen it, but I'm, I'm assuming that most of you have seen this. Um, <clears throat> and so this is really famous equation. And, and, and what you notice is that this is the second derivative geometrically, I got, I got the second derivative of phi. <clears throat> and so um, first derivative of a function gives you the slope. Second derivative of a function gives you what? Tell me, somebody, that's a question. The curvature? Yeah, it gives you curvature. And so when you look at the Poisson's equation, which is the most fundamental equation for electricity and magnetism, because it relates electric potential to charge density, which is sort of the most basic thing in E and M, then um, a way to think about it geometrically is that you have some, the way to think about it is that charge density, which is rho, causes curvature in phi. And, and that's it, that's all it says. That's like, you know, that's the basis of it. It's like, if I have charge density, then that's gonna cause curvature in phi. If there's no charge density, then there is no curvature in phi. <laughs> that's it. It's just a simple geometric relationship. You have a, a source, which is the charge density, which is then doing something to the phi, the potential, the solution. And in the case of Poisson's equation, the source, the charge density is causing curvature in phi. It causes curvature in the electric potential. And that's it. And from that simple geometrical relationship, we derive, you know, all of the NM, you know, and all that stuff. Um, so I just want you to get some sense. So in this case, the charge density is the source. See, it's that's the thing that's causing something. And then the curve, and then the phi is the, it's like the solution. That's the thing we, we want. And so that same reasoning worked for, um, for um, um, quantum mechanics. Because like in quantum mechanics, what we have for scattering is we're gonna have the, the source, well, the, the solution that we're looking for is psi, but what's the source? What's the thing that's causing something to happen? in psi, um, what do you think it's gonna be? Just without even writing an equation, what do you think it's gonna be for scattering? J, okay. the potential. The potential, exactly. It's gonna be, it's the potential because that's the whole point. You know, if we go back to this original picture right here, you know, for the scattering, you see it in the top. It's like, I got this potential that's causing something to happen. So it's the potential. Uh, and so, but of course there's details and it's never so simple, you know, but we'll, we'll work out all the details. Um, I think that the conceptual part is actually harder than the details. Um, okay, so now let's, um, let's do this. So let's, let's just remind ourselves how Green's functions work, just the basic math of Green's functions. And so the way Green's functions work is that if I have if you're given a uh, uh, you're given a differential equation, then the, the differential equation could be like this in one dimension. Let's say I have some differential operator like the one I just wrote up here, um, and then it acts on the solution, and the, there's a source term, right? Um, and so then the trick. Of Green's function, so we, we want, so what we want is the solution. So we we know we know the source we're given that, and we know the differential operator, but what we don't know is the solution. That's what we want, uh, and so the trick of Green's functions is to first solve another problem. This is the big trick: is to solve a simpler problem. 
So what we, we solve a simpler problem, which is this, we take that same differential operator and we hit it on this made up function, which is a function of two variables, x and x prime. And we put in this, this source term, x minus x prime. So that's the delta function. So we have a delta source and we basically say to ourselves, let's, let's replace the complicated f of x function, that complicated function with the simpler function because the delta function, even though it might not seem simple to you, it is. It's like the simplest function, it's just a spike. <laughs> so in some sense, the delta function is the simplest function. So we replace the complicated function with the simple function. And we're saying, let's keep, let's keep that same differential operator, but let's, let's ask ourselves, suppose we have a simple source, a delta function, what then is the response uh, that arises due to this differential operator from this much simpler source? Uh, and then, so you solve it, okay? And then you find the Green's function. And the whole point is that it's easier to, this is an easier problem to solve. And once you solve the easier problem, then what happens is it turns out that um, if you have solved that, then it turns out that your real solution psi of x is equal to psi naught of x plus the integral. And this is kind of like magic. Uh, of the Green's function integrated with the source term uh, dx prime. And that then is your solution. And that, that's the answer. So you have the answer. <laughs> and if you've never seen this before, it's like magic and it's very cool. Um, and so that's, that's the solution to your differential equation. So it's a very different way of solving differential equations than, than you might be used to. Um, like the way you learn in your first or second year of calculus. Uh, and so let's check that this is true. Let's check. Oh, 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 before we check, let me, I should ask, I should ask, what is this? What do you think psi naught of x? Maybe some of you already know this technique. Somebody tell me what's psi naught of x? Does anybody know what psi naught of x is? Is it the homogeneous solution? Exactly. Is that what you call it? Oh, yeah, the homogeneous or homogeneous or something. Yeah, you know what it is. Yeah, it's the homogeneous or homogeneous. I can't even remember the words anymore. It's been so long since I took differential equations. Um, but this is the the um, yeah the the homogeneous solution, which is basically just the solution to this. It's just the the solution when you have psi naught of x, you hit that differential operator and you get zero, okay? That's the homogeneous solution or homogeneous, or I'm not sure which word you use, but it's well-defined. So that's the, the homogeneous solution. Uh, is it homogeneous or homogeneous? I can't remember, does anybody remember? I think it's homogeneous. Okay, we'll call it the homogeneous solution. Okay, um, all right, there it is. Uh, okay, so that's the solution. Uh, and so let's check that it actually works. And so let's just hit uh, the differential operator on our sine out of x, our psi of x, and to see if it is really the solution. And so we hit it. So that means we're gonna first hit that homogeneous part, uh, but now we're gonna hit the, um, now we're gonna hit the, uh, this, this integral part, uh, f of x prime, dx prime, and so, this is an integral over x prime. And so this is an operator on x, so it can go right inside, it's okay. It doesn't mess up the integral. So it goes, it can go right inside. Uh, and so then we have this is the, and this guy turns into, what does he turn into, tell me? Zero. Zero. Right, because he's the homogeneous solution. And so now I have this, I have the integral, now I have d of x acting on the Green's function, which is a function of x. Uh, nothing else is in there. 
And, and now when the Green's function hits that, I'm sorry, when the differential operator hits the Green's function, what does it turn into? Delta function. Exactly. And so now I have the integral of the delta function with f of x prime over x prime. And what is, what is this integral now equal to? Tell me. Is it just f x? Yeah, exactly. Because that's a defining property of delta functions. And so then what we have is uh, the differential operator acting on psi of x is equal to f of x which means it's the answer. <laughs> that's, the, that's what we were looking for, right? We were looking for the function that solves that differential equation. So we, we have it. So that means then that, um, you know, therefore psi of X is the solution. Okay, so that there, I just sort of did the whole Green's function derivation for you. So now you guys are Green's function experts. <laughs> You've never seen it before, then you know it, it's fun to go go think about it for a while. Uh, now let's apply this to quantum mechanics. And when we apply it to quantum mechanics, then <clears throat> we're applying it to the Schrodinger equation. So because now the differential equation that we want to solve is this. Okay, that's our differential equation. So now let's cast it in the language of Green's functions. Um, and there's a few nuances. Um, so here it is, um, negative h bar squared over 2m, del squared uh, acting on psi, the, the wave function, uh, plus uh, the potential acting on psi um, is equal to e times psi. Okay, that's our Schrodinger equation. And so now we want to like rearrange it and make it look like a like a like a Green's function setup, and so it's a little bit funky, and so there's sort of a trick for how to do it. And the trick for how to do it is to is we're going to put this because we want to think of the potential as the source, so we'll put it on the right, and then the energy part we're going to put over on the other side. So we're going to rearrange it, and we're going to write it like this: uh, del squared, and then we're going to and then we're going to multiply by uh, negative one, which is no, that's no big deal, but it's gonna look like this. L squared psi of R uh, plus two ME over H bar squared psi of R is equal to two M V of R over H bar squared psi of R. Okay, and this should look a little familiar, this little guy here, uh, 2 me over h bar squared. What's that? Do you, rec do you recognize that? Isn't that k squared? Exactly. That's our old friend, k squared. From h bar squared, k squared over 2m equals e. That's right. So we'll replace that, by, that guy by k squared. And so now we have this sort of uh, simpler uh, Schrodinger equation, we write it like this. Well, it looks simpler, but it's still just as hard. Del squared, so let's write it. So now we'll write it like this. Um, now I can write like del squared plus k squared acting on psi of r is equal to um, some source term f of r. So we've done it where the source term f of r is equal to um, 2m v of r, got a psi of r in there, over h bar squared. Okay. So I've just rewritten it. And now you can see that my, my differential operator is going to be del squared plus k squared. And that's what's going to go into all of my Green's function machinery. That's my differential operator, D, that one. Okay, so, so this is the Schrodinger equation. And so, so now I have, so I have my source, the thing that's like causing things, and then I have my, my solution. 
and we want to solve this differential equation. Um, and so what we're going to do is just plug into this Green's function formalism and the Green's function formalism says, okay, if you want to solve that really hard differential equation, then what you have to do first is solve a much easier differential equation. Replace that complicated f of r source term with the simplest possible source term, which is just a spike, a delta spike. So first, must solve, first we have to solve this. We have to solve this um, simpler expression, which is del squared plus k squared uh, hits this Green's function and the source is a spike at r prime. Okay, and then, um, and if we can solve that, then what we have is, is this, then the real solution is gonna be psi of r is equal to um, psi naught of r uh, plus uh, the integral of my um, Green's function over all space, but it's integrated, but it's, in, it's multiplying the source term. And the source term in our case is 2m over h bar squared times v of r prime times psi of r prime. Okay, so that's it. So this is the source. But there is, a, there is an important little thing to notice, which is that we have that homogeneous term. Now, something important to notice is that there's many possible homogeneous terms. And so every different, for every different homogeneous term, we're gonna have a different solution. So let's index the solution according to which homogeneous term we stick there, okay? So let me index first the homogeneous term, I'll call it K. And then we'll index our main solution because we'll say that this is the solution that corresponds to this particular choice of homogeneous solution. All right, so that's, I think that's not too big a deal. Okay, so that's it. So, hold on a second. All right, so, um, okay. And so really all that we've done is we basically, to be honest, we haven't really done anything. I mean, because all we've done is just rewritten the Schrodinger equation. This is a new way to write the Schrodinger equation. We haven't yet solved anything. We've just kind of rearranged it in, in a new way, but it's still useful. What we've done is useful. We, I mean, we didn't do it for nothing. Um, so it's really just a rewriting of the Schrodinger equation. And one thing that will that I'm sure uh, uh, is making you a little uncomfortable is the fact that you know I have the solution. You know the solution is sitting inside of the source term, so that's a little uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, but math, you know physicists always mess around with math. You know, and and math is infinitely flexible. So. We're, we're, we're just gonna go with that. We're not gonna worry too much about that, okay? And the reason why we're not gonna worry about that is that when, it, when push comes to shove, we're just gonna make some gross approximations and not worry about it. So I know that for some of you, that's probably making you uncomfortable. Don't, don't, don't be uncomfortable, be happy. Don't worry about it. Um, so we just rewritten it to, you know, to in this Green's function formalism. Um, but now let's solve it. Let's solve it, okay? So, so to solve, then what do we have to do? So somebody tell me, what's the next step? Can anybody guess what's the next step? What's the next step? Solve for the homogeneous first. Um, 
Actually, that's a good, that could be the next step. You're right. Um, that wasn't the next step that I was thinking of, but you know, you're totally right. I think that is the next step, actually. I was thinking, I look at my page. So good, let's offer that. Let's, let's first do homogeneous solution. I was thinking of something else, but I realized that you're actually correct. Um, so this homogeneous solution is del squared plus k squared um, psi naught of k of r equals zero. So there you have it. That's the that's that's the homogeneous differential equation, and we got to solve it. So uh, I'll give you three seconds to solve it. One, two, three in your head. I'll give you two more seconds. One, two. Okay, now solve it and tell me the answer. I gave you like five seconds. That's a lot. It's more than I ever was given. Um, and so now I want you to tell me the answer. <laughs> What's the solution? The reason I'm being so flippant about this differential equation is because you've all seen it a million times and you've solved it a million times. And you, and the answer is like a really famous answer that you've seen a million times. So I'm hoping that one of you will just blurt it out. What's the answer? Is it gonna, like sinusoidal? Yeah, I think a sine. I think I think a sine wave would solve. Yeah, that's right. A sine wave would solve that. You're right. A sine. That's correct. Sine wave would solve that. But uh, but we prefer a different solution to this differential equation. What's our favorite solution of this differential equation? Oh, e to the i k x. Exactly. A plane wave. That's exactly right. This is our favorite solution. The reason it's our favorite solution is for many reasons you know one reason is because the mathematics of the plane wave is so simple but also for quantum mechanics we require these complex solutions uh, a traveling solution in quantum mechanics has to be complex or else it won't travel the you know probability flux is zero for real functions you guys must have you know someone you guys probably thought about that last semester you know if you have a real function then the probability flux is always zero you cannot have motion for real functions, for real wave functions. You, you, so complex functions are required in, in quantum mechanics. Okay, so, uh, all right, so here we have it. Plane wave, good, excellent. And so now you can see why we characterize the solution with K because this is the, and I think you can already sort of see where this is going. This is the incident wave. So the homogeneous solution is the incident wave in the scattering language that we've been using. Okay, good. So now what's the next thing? What's the second thing that we have to do? That was the first. What's the second thing? So for the delta equation. Exactly. We have to find the Green's function. Right. The second thing is we have to find the Green's function. That's exactly right. We got to solve this equation, this new equation, del squared plus k squared. And I promised you that it was easier than the original. So I got to make good on my promise. Okay, so there's the greens. So this is the equation that we got to solve. And so it turns out it's not like it's not totally trivial, trivial to solve that equation. It's a little bit of work, but it is easier than solving, you know, the general Schrodinger equation. So let's solve that. I'm not going to I'm not going to solve the whole thing, but let's solve it. I'll show you sort of how to solve it. Here's a trick to solving it. And this is a useful trick that often happens in, in partial differential equation. If you've taken a course in partial differential equations, which I suggest you do, so useful, then this trick kind of pops up all the time when you're solving partial differential equations. And the trick is to solve it in Fourier space, in reciprocal space, or let's just call it K space. Solve it in K space, reciprocal space. 
because often differential equations are much easier to solve in reciprocal space. So let's do it like this. So we write, so uh, we'll do a Fourier transform and we'll say that G of R, R prime is equal to some integral. And I'm just gonna do this really sloppy. You know, I'm not gonna be really careful about the math here because it's just the answer that matters. Um, and there's some Fourier transform G of Q, uh, D Q Q. Okay, so I would call this the Fourier transform of G of R, R prime. Okay, so that's, that's just defining the Fourier transform and then plug the Fourier transform into the differential equation. And so then what we have is uh, del squared plus k squared acting on g of r, which is now e to the i uh, q dot r minus r prime, g of q, d cubed q is equal to the delta function but since I'm doing everything in Fourier space, I might as well write the delta function in Fourier space. The delta function is the integral of, and I mean the Fourier transform, you know how a Fourier transform works. You have, you have the wave, you know, e to the i q dot r minus r prime. And then you have the Fourier transform, you can sort of think of the amplitude, right? The, the amplitude of the component of each wave, you know, you're adding up all those waves and each one has an amplitude associated with it. And that, and the uh, G of Q is, is, the, is the amplitude, the Q dependent amplitude, which is the Fourier transform of the function you're talking about. So the function we're talking about here is a Delta function. So what is that, amplitude, what is the amplitude of each wave for a delta function? What is the Fourier transform of a delta function, the, the, the Q dependent amplitude of each wave that goes into a delta function? It's kind of a trick question, but this is a fundamental property of delta functions that you should all know. And if you don't know it, then hopefully after in the next three minutes, you will know it. This is a really important property of delta functions. What is the amplitude of each wave component in a delta function? Tell me, what is the function that I should stick above the line that I drew there? Tell me. It's infinite. Uh, that's a good guess, you know, because if I, if I plug in R equals R prime, then the delta function blows up and is infinity. Uh, but no, that, that, but this part is, is more well, it's more well behaved than that. So it's something easier than infinity. It's one. Yeah. One. And this is really important because, um, you know, that's a, that's a property of a delta function is that it has, it has all a component of all waves. It's like all waves of all Q are added up. And the thing about the delta function that makes it special is that they all start at the same point in space. They all start with the same phase at zero. You know, so they all add up. So that's something you should think about. You know, like if you draw a delta function, it's kind of like you have, you know, like this is r equals r prime. It's like you got, you got this wave, and you got this wave, and you got this wave, and you got all those waves, and they cancel. They cancel everywhere, except they don't cancel at zero. <laughs> they don't cancel there. So you can sort of picture the Fourier you can sort of picture the Fourier transform of the delta function in your in your mind, and that that's how they that's why they are the way they are. Okay, so this is a delta function, uh, delta of r minus r prime. Uh, that's what delta function is, uh, and so now we can bring this guy inside, and so when the delta hits this, what does the delta turn into? And this is why we love. Um, uh, Fourier space. What does the delta turn into? The delta squared. Delta squared turns into what? I can bring that operator inside because it's not acting on it's not acting on Q and it's an integral over Q. So what does that delta squared turn into? Can you see it? Think of it like this. 
what happens if I have d squared dx squared of e to the i kx? What does that turn into? Do you see it? Negative q squared e to the yeah. iqr. That's right. It, the, the d squared dx squared turns into negative k squared. And you still have the e to the i kx there. That's right. And so that means that the del squared is going to turn into a minus q squared when it hits that thing. And so this is going to be then, um, it's going to be um, integral of, um, let's see, uh, k, uh, k squared minus q squared um, times g of q times e to the i q dot r minus r prime d cube q is equal to um, integral of one times e to the i q dot r minus r prime d cube q. And so the way we look at this is we say, hey, those integrals are the same. <laughs> That's the same. That part is the same on both sides. And so that means that if I look at these circled parts, what can I say about these circled parts? Somebody tell me. You can conclude that the circle part is equal to one. That's exactly right. They must be equal. That's correct. And so therefore, I would say that k squared minus q squared g of q is equal to one in which case <clears throat> I have G of Q, I solved it. So G of Q is really easy to get. It's one over uh, K squared minus Q squared. <clears throat> okay, so I got, the, so that's G of Q. And then to get the Green's function, what do I have to do? Where did I do it? Oh yeah, it's right here, see? at the very top. I just have to do the inverse Fourier transform. All right, so then G, so I just have to plug it into that equation. So G of R, R prime is equal to the uh, integral of E to the I Q dot R minus R prime, uh, one over K squared minus Q squared D cubed Q. Okay, I just have to do that. So I just have to do this inverse Fourier transform and then you get the Green's function. Um, um, okay, so, um, but it turns out that uh, this is a little bit of work. Well, it's not so hard if you know contour integrals. Uh, you, you, the, the way this is typically solved is using a contour integral. And if you're a master of contour integrals, then it's really easy. But if you don't know what a contour integral is, then it's really hard. And contour integrals are something that you learn in complex analysis. So I think learning some complex analysis is a useful thing. You know, even though you know you might not do contour integrals all the time, but it's nice to kind of have some sense of what they are. So I'm not going to do all that. But but if you do the math, and the math, I'm pretty sure it's in your book. It's in, the math is in Griffiths, and the math is also in other books like Saxon. Um, and then you get the math, and then you get the answer, and the answer is this. And the point is that um, the, uh, the Green's function is this, minus E to the I, K, r minus r prime over four pi r minus r prime. Well, that's the magnitude. And that is the answer. And it's not too hard to get, but you do need to do a little green, a little contour integral stuff. And, you know, it's just some fancy math. I'm not going to do it, but that's the answer. Okay. So I sort of wanted to sort of step you through it a little bit. Um, so 
that's the answer. And that's just some weird formula, you know, and I, that you just, I've just written down, but it's also very geometrical. So what is the geometrical interpretation of this function? Somebody tell me, what is that thing that I just wrote? Can you see it? What is it? Well, I'll give you a hint. It looks wavy. It has like a wavy nature to it. It's a wave. What kind of wave? I'll give you another hint. It's not a plane wave. Is it a decaying wave? It is a decaying wave. But what kind of decaying wave? Is it like that sink function we looked at briefly? Uh, I guess it's a little bit like that. Yeah. But what's the symmetry of this wave? the spatial symmetry of it. Well, it's symmetric on both sides of our prime, right? Yeah. And it's, it's, it's gonna be symmetric under rotations because it has no directionality to it because I'm taking the absolute magnitude of R minus R prime. So when you think of something symmetric under rotations, what is that thing? Is that called point symmetry? It is a point symmetry, right? But but it's it's a it's a particular point symmetry because like you you could be symmetric under like sixty degree rotations. So then spherically degree. symmetric. Yes, it's spherically. This one is symmetric under all rotations. So that means that it's spherically symmetric. So this is this. So these this is a spherical wave, and it's an outgoing spherical wave. Because remember, it, it, because here I have the plus, and when you have the plus, that's outgoing. If I put a minus, then that would become be incoming. So this is an outgoing spherical wave, and just call it outgoing is a little bit, you know, phony because there's no time dependence here. But the point is that in quantum mechanics, there's always a time dependence because in quantum mechanics, to get, the, to get time, we always just multiply uh, by, I won't use X, we, we always multiply by E to the negative I E T over H bar, remember that? For an eigenstate. And so if I hit this wave by the, e to the minus i e t over h bar, then it, then you could see that it actually is a, a traveling outgoing wave. So when somebody gives you a function in quantum mechanics, when somebody gives you a function that has no time in it, and they start acting as though it has some time dependence, what you should do in your mind is you should say, okay, well, what they've done is they've multiplied it by e to the negative i e t over h bar, because that's what they've done. But but people who do quantum mechanics a lot, they just do it naturally without even thinking. So like when I look at this, I say, oh, that's an outgoing wave. But what I've done is I've multiplied it by e to the negative i e t over h bar without even you know thinking about it. But when you're seeing it for the first time, you have to think about it. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, um, okay, good. It's an outgoing spherical wave. And, and I just want you to get some sense of the geometry of this, like the geometrical interpretation, because what's happening is that we started with this, you know, the Green's function was this. We, this is the Green's function that we solved. Uh, I want you to, to understand like, th because this is, think of that as like causing wave propagation. And this is like a point source. There's something really simple here. You know, there's all this fancy math, but, it, but, it, but deep down there's something so simple because really what I'm doing, I'm just dropping a rock in a pond. It's the same as dropping a rock in a pond. Because I drop a rock in a pond, the pond is all flat. I drop the rock and what happens is after the rock hits, you get these waves and they decay. All right, so this is before and this is after. So I've dropped a rock in a pond, drop, and it goes boink, and it makes this outgoing spherical wave, whoa. 
And so I dropped the rock in the pond at R. I dropped the rock in the pond at R equals R prime. And then, and then I ask, well, what happens at some other distance R away? So that's the, that's the whole point. It's like saying, what it, this equation is saying, what happens at R due to a point source at R prime? All right, so, so you think of the delta functions at R prime, and then we're asking what happens at this further distance away R due to the point source. And then, and then this part here, this, this operator is basically tells you the property of the medium. The, the operator is the property of the medium. It's like, you know, how elastic is the medium? You know, and that's all, all that physics is in that differential operator. So, so the physics, so this is just the physics of dropping a rock in a pond and getting a water wave, all right, at, at some further distance away. And this G of R minus R prime is the water wave. It's just an outgoing wave. It's literally plotted out on your computer. It's a wave. It's just an outgoing wave. Okay, so that's the geometrical interpretation. So now let's do the math. And so what we then did is we now have psi of K uh, of R, my solution to the Schrodinger equation, I can write it now as e to the i uh, k dot R uh, minus uh, m over 2 pi h bar squared integral of, now I have my Green's function, k R minus R prime um, divided by R minus R prime times the source, which is V of R prime, um, times the wave function solution, psi of R prime, D cube R prime. Okay, so that's what we have. That's our solution. Um, and, you know, it's, and so this is a, this is a general solution to the Schrodinger equation. Um, and so, um, but it's still kind of complicated looking because it, it doesn't, it hasn't really given us anything too useful yet because it's still just a big ugly mess, but there should be some insight because now you can kind of see how the source, the potential, you can th see how, think of how the potential is like creating waves at every point. And those are outgoing waves and those waves all add up at some further location to give me the actual solution to the Schrodinger equation. That geometric interpretation I just said should remind you of something. It's called, it's a, it's called a principle, some, a something principle. Does anybody know what principle that is? You've all heard of it. This should remind you of something. It's called Higgins principle. Have you all heard of Higgins principle? It's something that this guy Higgins came up with in like, you know, the 1600s. I mean, so long ago, he was trying to understand wave propagation. And he said, well, if I have a traveling wave, then at every point on the wave front, I nucleate another wave and all those waves add up. Uh, at some further location, and that's how the wave propagates. It's just like nucleating waves that travel and add up at some further point. And that, this is like a guy in the 1600s who came up with that. And it turns out that he's <laughs> he's kind of right. Uh, that's why we still remember his name. Uh, and so that's kind of what sort of, I mean, so when I look at this, it sort of reminds me of Higgins principle because it's like you're integrating over the source and at every point in the source, it's like it's like the source is sending out all these waves at every point. And those waves are all adding up some further place, some further away point at R, and that's creating the solution, the actual uh, solution of the Schrodinger equation. Okay, but let's not trip on it too hard. Uh, and so, what we want to do is we want to get this math. We want to we, we, we want to get this into a more mathematical, palatable form. So there's still some more tricks that we're going to do. So we let's simplify it some. Let's make some approximations. So not, we haven't made any approximations yet. So it's time for approximations. 
And so the first approximation we'll make <clears throat> is that R is big and R prime is small. That's our first approximation. And that should make sense to you because look, this is the situation. We have the incoming wave, we have the outgoing wave, we have some detector, detector, uh, that's the K final. And so the idea is that this is the potential. The R prime is living, think of the R prime is determined by the potential. But the, the, but the detector is what determines R. Because it's sort of like, this is the, the geometry. We have, we have the potential at zero, V of R prime. You know, we're, we're doing this integral over R prime. But then we have this gigantic R which is at the detector because we want to know what, because remember, we want to know what's happening at the detector. We want to know the particles that are going into the detector. So eventually we want to know the, because remember we want to know, we want to know the, remember the whole point is that we want to know the J that's flowing into the detector, but to get J, we've got to get Psi. And so we need to then know the wave function at the detector because that then determines what is the probability flux flowing into the detector. So, um, so R is the detector. And, but, but when we do, but we're doing this integral over R prime, but notice in the integral, we have the potential. And so when the potential goes to zero, the integrand is zero and the integral we don't need to we we don't need to integrate where the potential is zero and so as we go far away from the potential that integral is just zero so we so our prime is only really close to the potential so it's like at cern lhc you're going to crash the protons are colliding but the potential that they're feeling is only tiny 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 but then they're going and they're spraying all that stuff but it's going into detectors that are far away uh, and so R is the detector that's far away and R prime is the potential, it's tiny, tiny. Okay, so I want you to, to appreciate that. And so what that means then is that we can do an approximation because what makes this integral so hard for the solution, the hard part is this, is, is the hard part is this R minus R prime in the denominator and in the numerator too, that's the hard part. So we got to simplify that. And so this is how we're going to simplify the, the math of that. We're going to do this trick. We're going to say, um, we're going to use this math trick. And the math trick is that any function of um, r minus r prime can be written. Well, actually, let, let me, let, I'm going to even make it simpler. It's a, such a simple math trick. It's like, I'm going to do this. Remember this, f of x plus delta is equal to, um, approximately equal to f of x plus delta times df dx. Okay, you all know this trick, that trick. Okay, so that's a famous trick. That's like, you know, the fundamental theorem of calculus or it has some ostentatious name that I can't quite remember, but you've all seen it. So let's use this trick. Let's say, let's use that same trick because that's for, that works for small delta. You all know that. So now let's do it here. R minus R prime is approximately equal to F of R minus, because there's a negative sign there, minus R prime times what? What should I put here? Can you guess? Well, I won't burn up too much time worrying about that, but it's the derivative of R, of the function. 
So this is so this is the an analog analogous uh, three dimensional vector equation of that very simple uh, one dimensional fundamental theorem of calculus equation. Okay, so this is the trick. So this is what we're going to use. We're going to use this trick, uh, and now we're going to apply it to this function. So we're going to do, so our function is going to be this, the Green's function. So we're going to say that the Green's function e to the i k r minus r prime over this outgoing wave. We're going to we're going to say well that's approximately equal to that same function but only of r which is e to the i k r over r minus r prime times del of that function, e to the i k r over r. And this really simplifies it. And then if you screw around and do that derivative, you can see that this is a pro can be approximately written as e to the i k r over r times e to the negative i k r hat dot r prime. Okay, and so to get from here to here, there's some algebra that I'm going to skip, but you guys could work it through. Try working it through and see for yourself. I'll skip that algebra. But what I've done is I've taken this and I've equated, now I'm going to replace it with this. Okay, so this is what I did. And this is very important because what I've done is I've separated, the, the significance of this is that I separated, I separated R, the radial, uh, the, the radial variable from R prime. I separated them. And that was mathematically very significant because now, what I can do is, is I will plug this into the integral, plug into integral, the integral form of psi, and then we get this. So we're gonna plug it in. So this is the integral of psi right here, that's psi. So now I'm gonna plug this into it and I get this new integral, this new uh, wave function. <clears throat> and it looks like this. Um, it looks ugly at first, but it's it's actually quite beautiful in the end. Um, e to the i k dot r. Um, now I'm plugging in minus m over two pi h bar squared. It's a lot of math to get something very simple. So. Uh, I promise you it will simplify. <laughs> it won't be hideous integrals all the time. Uh, e to the negative i uh, k r hat dot r prime v of r prime psi of r prime v cubed r prime. Um, and then I put a bracket here and I multiply the whole thing by e to the i k r over r. And that's really important because you see, when I did this thing here and I, I, multi I take my Green's function, which is this outgoing wave, and I say that it's equal to this thing times this thing. Well, the significant part is that this is not a function of r prime, so I can take it out of the integral, take out of integral. So this part I took out of the integral. See, when I plugged it all into that big integral up here, I could take out this part. It's outside of the integral. I know this is just math, but it's, a, it's really important math. And so this integral now, you see, is it depends on r hat, but r hat is 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 determined by the the variables theta and phi and so this is now depends only on direction depends on r hat which is direction and that's the direction of the outgoing wave direction 
of outgoing wave. Uh, and and so, <clears throat> so you, you see, I have this R prime and the integral is over R prime. So once I've done the integral, R prime goes away. And before I had that in the integral, what would be left is the variable R. But, but now uh, the R vector. And so the R vector has now gone, I've decomposed it into a radial part and a direction. And the radial part I took out of the integral, but the directional part is still in the integral. And so what all this means is this, and I'm sorry for just, sometimes the words are so hard, but the math is, is sort of simple. What, what, I, what I mean by all this is that psi k of r is equal to the homogeneous solution, which is just a traveling, which is just a plane wave, plus the outgoing solution, this, this, this is the integral times e to the i kr over r. That's what I mean. That, that this is the final. This is the final point that I've been trying to make. It's just this: the wave function can be written as an incident wave plus an and this is an outgoing wave, <clears throat> outgoing spherical wave. And this is a function of theta and phi of the direction, because r hat is the direct, because remember this is, this is r, and r is r theta, Phi. That's what that's what the vector r is, and so um, I've separated out the the radial component from the direct from the directional component, and so we have this and this and so this is the integral that we just derived integral, and that integral is is that big integral right there. So it's it's this thing. Um, f of r hat is equal to negative m over 2 pi h bar squared e to the minus i k r hat dot r prime v of r prime psi of uh, r prime d cubed r prime. Um, and so that big hideous integral is here, it's still there, but the point is, is that that big integral just gives us uh, some function, which is a function of, of the angle, the direction. And that's just, uh, and so that, and so we, we see, so what we see then is we have the form of the Schrodinger equation, a form of the wave function. The form of the wave function is that the scattered wave psi of k of r is equal to an incident wave e to the i k dot r plus uh, an outgoing wave e to the i k r over r times some function which depends on whatever direction you're talking about. So that outgoing wave is modulated. So it has different strengths in different directions and different angles. And so that, and, and you can draw this. And so this is the way we draw it. There's my scatterer because this has a very simple geometrical interpretation. This is telling me that my wave function is this. I have my incident wave, wave, right? There's my incident wave. K incident. And then I have my outgoing wave because it's scattering like this. And that's my outgoing wave. 
outgoing wave. But the outgoing wave is modulated first. So for different directions, it can have different amplitude because of that prefactor f of theta phi. Um, and this thing, and this part we call, um, so this is like the, this is the most important result, one of the most important results from scattering. It's the form of the scattered wave function. So it's basically telling you that in quantum mechanics, if a particle is scattering off of some potential, then the eigenstate of that particle looks like this. So it's like sort of a generic universal eigenstate for, for the scattering problem. So it's very important. And it, and it gives you a very simple framework to understand scattering. It's like this is, so for any potential you have, the form of the solution always looks like this. It's just an incident wave plus a scattered wave. So it's kind of simple. And so, but the, the only part that's hard is this thing. You know, how do we know this? That thing is some big scary integral. It's this thing, right? So that that turns out like all the hard physics is buried in that F. So all the hard, all the hard physics that we still haven't figured out yet is buried in this F of theta and phi, which is we call the scattering amplitude, scattering amplitude. Now we call it the scattering amplitude because this function F is telling us how much of the wave is in that direction. And to get that function is really hard because you've got to do that hideous integral. But but there's a lot we can do even without getting that function. It, just knowing that it exists is enough for us to do a lot. And so let's, uh, let me show you what I'm talking about. Because what we can do is now, we can, now we're ready to solve, to find the differential cross section. We want to, let's use this to find the differential cross section. Because that was the whole reason why we did all of this. That was the whole reason for this whole treatment. Because what we have is, remember we have d sigma, d omega, the differential cross section is one over j times j dot ds into the detector divided by d omega. And so now we can sort of see how this works because we have, this is the situation. We have the potential and we see that the wave function looks like this. We have our incident wave and then we have our scattered wave. And then here's my detector. And my detector is located at R. And this is my, and so this is my uh, incident. And, and so what we wanna find is, and my detector has some DS. So what we need is we, we, we need to find J and we need to find, uh, we need to find J incident, right? And then we need to find J dot DS into detector. And we're gonna use this formula, J is equal to H bar over two MI times psi star del mm -hmm. psi minus psi del psi star. Uh, and we're gonna, and we now we know psi because psi is equal to an incident wave plus a scattered wave. And so it's a really simple expression for the wave function. All the complexity is buried in that function f, but even without knowing what it is, I just know it's some function of theta and phi. I just won't worry about it. Let's not worry about it right now. We'll get that later. But just knowing the form of the solution is quite useful because now what I can do is I can, I can plug this into this. And so let's, find J and we can do that really easily because this is, so this is the J incident out here. 
And so now we know the form of the wave function. Psi is equal to a plane wave plus a scattered wave. And so when I'm out here, far away on the left, far away, J incident, <clears throat> what is the scattered wave part? What do you think is the strength of the scattered wave when I'm calculating J incident? I'm far away. Very small. Exactly. So small that we'll call it what? Zero. Yeah, we'll call it zero. So for the incident part, the, for the incident part, I just will use this plane wave, e d i k dot r. And so that means that if I just plug this into my j formula, j is equal to h bar over 2mi psi star del psi minus psi del psi star. If I just plug it in, it's really easy. And we did it already. And it's going to be uh, it's a little formula that we already do. I can cut off the file, just write it down. It's, h bar k over m. So that's the incident flux. All right, and so so it's like a trivial result, but but we but now that we've done all the hard this hard math, we can start now the math can start becoming more easy. So we got the j incident, and so the next thing we got to do is we got to find the j that goes into the detector. And for the detector, we cannot ignore the scattered wave because uh, that's the most important part is the scattered wave. So basically, let's just plug, let's just plug the full psi into this formula to get the J that goes into the, the detector. We're just gonna plug that into that formula and we're just gonna do the derivatives and everything and then just dot it into our detector and that'll give me the J going into the detector. So the, you know, the, the mathematical strategy is quite simple. And so we'll, that's what we'll do next, but we don't have time to do it today, right now, but we'll do that next, next time. This is where I'll start off uh, on Thursday. Okay, folks, bye-bye. Sir, I have a question. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. So <laughs> what, what was the justification or like the approximation justification for like having the source term um, including psi, even though we're supposed to know what the source term is? Well, we haven't made an approximation there yet. We, we're just kind of, we've just created a whole mathematical framework. And I think, and I, and I, feel, uh, I feel confident that the mathematical framework we've created is self-consistent, you know? We're just, you know, we're, we're but, but the part that's screwy and that's hard is, how do I find F? So the problem that you've just pointed out is gonna come when, when someone says to you, hey dude, what's F? <laughs> really, what is it? <laughs> you know, calculate F. And then you'll say, okay, I know how to find F. I'll just go to this integral that the professor derived in class and I'll just solve that integral. But then when you go to solve that integral, you'll notice, hey, I got a wave function in there. <laughs> and you go, oh, you know, big problem. Okay, so that's when you hit the problem, okay? Yeah. That's the problem, but we haven't hit that problem yet. So everything we did today in class was very, was self-consistent and okay. We have not washed away that psi yet, all right? But, but we will, <laughs> we, we will, we'll deal with that problem, but we don't have to deal with it just yet. Okay, so so I, I will I will deal with that say in the next lecture. Okay, so for this green function like formulation, it's not necessary that the that like like the source term in the in the differential equation is known. Yeah, it, the the potential is known, but psi is not known. Okay, but actually, I'll tell you the trick right now. Since we're talking, I mean, I'll just tell you the trick. What we're gonna do? One thing you can do is check it out. This is my function. Oh, damn it. This is my this is my function right here. Yeah. So that's my psi. So look, I'm gonna take that psi and I'm gonna plug it into here, okay? Into that integral, right? Mm -hmm. But what if I took this psi and what if I said, well, the scattered wave is small? 
So what I can do then is drop the scatter the, the uh, scattered wave part of my psi. What am I left with? Just E T I K. Exactly. That's what we're gonna do. See, that's the trick. Then it becomes okay. really easy. And, and then all that's left there is V of R. And then it actually turns into, guess what? The Born approximation. That is, that is the Born approximation. So that's one way of dealing with this problem. And we'll do that next time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.